You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything screenwriting. Here we interview successful screenwriters and filmmakers to find out just what it takes to make it in the industry. Real quick before we get started, I wanted to mention that we are celebrating our one year anniversary of the Successful Screenwriter Podcast with a huge giveaway. This is awesome. We have a ton of prizes for you from mentorships, to swag and you can enter it absolutely for free all you have to do is visit the successful screenwriter facebook page and click on the giveaway tab or go to the successful screenwriter.com slash podcast now you can enter multiple times too but keep an ear out this episode for the secret code which you can get five free entries with now on to our show all right, welcome to the podcast. I have on an awesome guest today, director of Street Out of Brooklyn. He also wrote the video game 187. He's been teaching at Sundance and AFI, and he even mentors at Woodstock. This is Maddie Rich. Thanks for being on with us. Nice to meet you. Really appreciate you inviting me on here, and uh, hello to your listeners. All right. Well, I know that uh, you have a pretty unique approach to your own writing process and especially with structure. And I thought maybe we could dive into that today. But before we really get into it, I do want to get a little bit of your origin story because I know you have a unique story as far as Straight Out of Brooklyn goes, which was your debut film. I was the young 19 year old filmmaker uh, when it was released uh, in the theaters and um I started this process when I was about 17 years old. Wow. Growing up in Brooklyn, New York and the Red Hook section of Brooklyn and always just wanted to become a filmmaker. But of course, I I didn't know anyone in the entertainment business. Uh, And one day my mom gave me a a book by Lenny Lipton. Okay. And uh, it was... I believe it was called The Guide to Independent Filmmaking. And that really just caught my eye. And, um, but I never thought that I would become a writer, director, producer, actor, all of those different hyphens wow. and doing video game stuff until uh, I enrolled in NYU. Uh, and when I was in class, everything that the professor was saying, I read, uh, and heard about from 250 film books that I had under my bedroom. Yeah. And um, and so I decided, and I told my mom that I wanted to make this film kind of autobiographical about my life, about a young man growing up in rental housing projects, hearing his father mentally and verbally abusing his mom. Wow. Uh, his father was a Vietnam vet and, uh, but the, 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 the nucleus of this African-American family is they wanted the American dream. And there was this young kid, the center character named Dennis, who heard all of the pain and frustration that his dad was was talking about of not having the American dream, coming back from Vietnam War uh, and not getting the hero's welcome, not getting the opportunity to to get a good job, right? And so he didn't know how to 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 relate to that to relate to his reality so he started drinking alcohol he started right. you know abusing his wife so the center character named Dennis was taking all of this information in uh and he decides with his friends and I played one of the friends okay you, see, you could probably see the character my poster right yeah. behind me yeah. yeah that's me the younger me <laughs> <laughs> and um uh to drop to rob a drug deal and they devised this plan. And he thought, he thought, the lead character thought that this would change the nucleus of this family to take this money to move them out in the neighborhood and move them into a better place in life. But we all know that a story like that ends tragically. Yeah. And um, 
So we made the, I made the movie with the help of my mom and, and sister initially with credit cards. Wow. Then I, I, I went on a, a New York radio station and I talked to potential investors. This is before crowdfunding and all that. Oh, yeah. So, so, <laughs> this is the 90s. This is the 90s. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I went to regular people, just like the people who are listening to you right now. And I told them my passion, my story as a 17-year-old filmmaker, and I needed their help. And I uh, had a screening in New York City and showed just a little clip of of the opening because the film wasn't finished yet. Yeah. And that gauged their interest. In, um, and, and, and that goes to, uh, I wanna make a point for all the filmmakers, the writers that are listening to you right now. Yeah. You don't have to wait to start making your movie. You can begin that process right now with a proof of concept. Yeah. And that's what I did with Straight Out of Brooklyn initially. And then when I had the screening with the investors, I raised uh, the money to finish the movie with the help of regular community people. Amazing. And um, after it was done, the great late uh, Jonathan Demi, uh, I was doing editing my film at this studio in New York City. And he was editing uh, Silence of the Lamb. <laughs> And he happened to knock on my door, my editing door, because I had a big poster outside, <laughs> eye-catching poster. And he asked, who was Maddie Rich? And I said, me, but I didn't know who he was. So I kicked him out of the room. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my assistant uh, and editor said, do you know who that is, man? He's doing, that's Jonathan Demi. He's doing Silence of the Lamb. So I had my first little Hollywood 101. I kissed his behind the next day and invited him to uh, my screen, uh, to my editing room. And Jonathan Demi did something that I'll never forget. He came, he said, I'm gonna, I'll be at your editing bay for my lunch. And he sat and he watched my entire movie on a flat bay wow. editing machine. He watched every single reel and at the end of that, he said, this is, he said, number was, he said, how old are you? <laughs> and he said, cause this was a 35 millimeter feature film. Was yeah, that yeah. Film? Yeah. And, um, and then Jonathan Demi introduced me to Ira Deutschman, who was an independent producer. He went to run Fine Line Features. Ira came on the project as uh, executive producer. And um, then American Playhouse, which was a popular uh, television station, PBS, they saw the movie first clip and uh, they purchased the TV rights for Straight Outta Brooklyn. Wow. And I thought, Jeffrey, that that was over, right? Yeah. That was the end of my journey because my whole thing of making this movie was for high school kids to show them what not to do. Yeah. What not to do. There's the right way to, to get out of any situation wherever you may be living. If it's New York City, Germany, no matter what, is education. Mm -hmm. Education, right? That's the right way. The, the first and best way to get out of any situation is to go to school, to empower yourself. Then you can really empower other people in your community. Um, but then I was told that uh, Sundance Film Festival, the early Sundance, um, <laughs> Yes, I uh, wanted to show my movie in, in the competition. We got accepted. That's cool. And the movie went to win the, the Special Grand Jury Award. And Sundance is like an extended family to me. Um, and as I mentioned uh, prior to us getting on, that uh, during before the pandemic, I started uh, teaching a uh, as an instructor a writing course and a directing course for Sundance online courses. So. So, uh, so Strata Brooklyn went on to do great things and which brought me to Hollywood and uh, brought me to have a development deal at TriStar Pictures and developed a couple of my projects over there. Uh, but then I got the opportunity to direct my second film right. that I did not write called The Inkwell, which starred uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, Lorenz Tate, a lot of hosts of just amazing actors. Yeah. Uh, and that went on to, to do extremely well. Yeah, It's absolutely incredible. At ni 19 years old, 
you know, yeah. that you you had a theatrical release and and uh, the drive that you have. And it's inspiring. It really is inspiring. And and thank you. Uh, and that drive still exists today in the older version of me, because it comes from when you know that you have a calling yeah. that you have something inside of you that needs it just to be birthed. Yeah. And, 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 and to me, that's art. And I love working with young writers and young directors because they have something to say. Yeah. But, but a lot of them don't know how to say it. Oh, that's so true. Right? They don't yeah. know how to say it and how to structure a script. Like everybody, not everybody, some artists, some people have really good ideas. Right. And some people have ideas that need to be further developed, right? Um, and so I get this, this, this thing a lot, Jeffrey, of I had this script and I would love for you to be involved with the script. And then I always come back to say, do you know structure? Right. Yes, it is a fundamental. Do you know structure? What is your story about? What are you ultimately trying to say to people? Yeah. Even if you're doing a comedy, if it's a big Avengers blockbuster or it's an indie dramatic film, what are you trying to say? And do, do you have interesting characters that are, are relatable to people outside of your community, outside of your box. Oh man, we speak the same language. I love this. <laughs> yeah, we, we really do. Uh, be, I want to go back just a second, just because you're talking about working with students, and I love working with students or mentoring other writers. And what I really love about the process is watching their voice as a writer develop. Oh my god! Like as yes. as a mentor, as a teacher. That is so cool when you start to see their work kind of change and turn and flip into something new and you go, they're getting it. I yes. love that feeling. And I can, I, I definitely see how that's, that's definitely a calling now. Um, creating with structure, I find a lot of writers will get stuck on concept. They have a great idea for a story, but there's no heart or soul behind it. There's no theme right. that they're trying to say. And a lot of times when I have clients come in or students come in, it's all concept. I have this great idea about dinosaurs mm -hmm. in a park, but we don't know what to say about it. <laughs> exactly. And I always say when, when I'm teaching a course of working with writers is I want to know information. I want to know information within the first 15 pages. Right. And, and the information that I want to know in your story is who is the main character? Yeah. What is the issue at hand? What is the issue at hand? I would like to also know is the main character, the protagonist, I don't want to know all of his or her flaws, but I want to understand a little bit about his or her or their flaw. Right. And I also want to reveal, you got to reveal this to me quickly to understand the drag, to, to push me in to, to capture my attention, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I also want to know what is the problem at stake? Okay. What is the issue? What's the issue at stake, right? Yeah. And I also want to know, I'm still on the first 15 pages. <laughs> I'm still on the first 15 pages. Why will anyone care? Boy, that's something that a lot of people don't even take into consideration. What's what's right. going to make you want to read this, you know? Because because what? writers writers will have an idea. They like the idea. It's an interesting idea. But why would anybody else care? It's a very good question. Why do it? Why do it? Why does anyone else care? I'm not, yeah. I'm talking about as creators. We have to start thinking about not the box of the genre that you're writing for. Right? We sometimes we as a writers we write genre. Sure, right? of course, yeah. You write a buddy, a buddy cop movie or just a buddy action movie, right. and you're writing a structured drama. 
a structured uh, genre movie. Yeah, you're playing in that sandbox. Right. But I want you to get out of that sandbox. I want you to get out of that because originality is what I like. I like originality, and yeah. especially when you're trying to be an impactful entertainment writer a writer that it may be social has you have a social commentary okay that originality style meaning are important to me okay right and so in that in those first 15 pages i need to understand like i said why does anyone care yeah and after, after the, the from the from 15 pages to the 30 pages then i want to know where are we going? Right. So where you're kind of you like to split act one up in half. I do. I yeah. do. I do the same thing with the the, the second act structure. I break yeah. that in half because that the second act to me, like a two A and a two B. Yes, and you, yeah. and Jennifer, you know why I like the second act so much because that is why we came. <laughs> it's all conflict. But that's what makes or breaks a writer. Like yes. in act two is where everybody gets lost or stuck. Yes, but I see that as the, the that is why you have, you turned on to that streaming app. That's why you went to the, uh, the motion picture, the movie theater. Yeah. The second act is the conflict. Oh, it's yeah. the protagonist meeting the antagonist and it is the resistance for the protagonist. It's the res yeah. This is why we go to the movies. Yeah. This is why thrilling. we turn we exactly. Yeah. The, the third act is 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 the easiest part. Because the, the third act is where you can make your statement. I agree. And I think the third act is the easiest to write. Yes. I think that because it because it kind of sums itself up. I mean, you want to add in twists, you want to have in some surprises, of course, in the third act, but I find the third acts tend to lead themselves to their own resolution. Yes. Um I feel like anybody can write a first act up to a certain point because everybody has that idea of a character, but mm -hmm. then when it gets close to act two, they kind of fizzle out. <laughs> yes, because that, that is with that, that is the journey part of right. the film. That is the journey. That is the hardest part. And it's the most, to me, the most interesting part of the film is the second act. Yeah. Right. Now the third act, I'll tell you, when I did Strata Brooklyn. Sure. Uh the third act existed of, as I mentioned, the son and his friends stole this money from this drug dealer. The friends realized this is way too much for me. The son walked around the housing projects with a, a suitcase full of money. The drug dealer is like, I now I want my money back, and now you're gonna pay. Yeah. The the father. Uh, the, his, the mom has a heart attack. The drug dealer is now after the father. Yeah, He's looking for the father. I cut off the movie when the drug dealer shoots the dad and there's like quick cuts yeah. of the dad, the mom passing, the son, and then I stopped it. Right. And we fade the black and I put a quote that I wrote, first things learned are the hardest to forget. Hmm. Traditions pass from one generation to the next. We need to change. Credits roll. Powerful. That, there was no I'm nice tie boat to yeah. uh, a ribbon around this. Not for that movie. It didn't need There's it. Some, it no. didn't need it because you said you said what you needed to say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And so the third act is where you make your statement. Your statement it could be the Avengers. You know, it could be <laughs> we're saving the world. <laughs> we're saving right. the world. It could yeah. be the guy gets the girl. Right. Yeah. Or it could be I've overcome this obstacle. Or it could just be I'm going to sit and make you think before you get up. I like I like a, a film that makes the makes somebody talk about it on the way back to the car. Like yeah. if I can do that, if I can have you thinking about this or talking about it the next day at work, I feel like I did my job. Yes.
Yes, and, and, and that's what we as writers and creators, that's what we want, right? Yeah. That's why we, we, we work on these projects. I have projects that I've been working on for years. This, the development, it just never stops. I tell uh, young writers, you will continue to keep writing until the day that you're on the set, until the day that the scene is done. Oh yeah. It doesn't so, end it doesn't end after you after your option if you stay on the gig hopefully. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that part, right? Yeah, yeah, that part. Yeah, and I tell you I'm I'm so happy you brought that up because a lot of writers don't realize that you can get rewritten. Oh, you can in, get written out of your own film. You can. Yeah. But I have to be honest, the first time when I wrote a studio project in I was attached as a director, the writer, director, producer, but I wrote the script up into one point in the studio exec. My exec said, we should bring on somebody who has fresh eyes to this. Now, writers out there, you can take that the wrong way. It makes me nervous. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take that the wrong way. You can yeah. feel some kind of way yeah. that you are going to have someone else come on to give another dimension to this. Hopefully right. It will be in the right dimension. Exactly. But this is part of it. Remember, what we do is a collaborative thing. This is a collaborative medium. Don't feel like you are slighted because someone else is coming on board to help collaborate on something that you took to a certain point right there is so much money behind a project at, yes. at one point you have to kind of expect they're going to bring on somebody else just because there's so much writing on it it's almost right. best to look at films like there are their own little mom and pop businesses and there's a lot of money writing on it yes. so yeah they want to do what they have to do to succeed and if they think that's bringing somebody else in that then that's bringing somebody else if it makes the project better but there are projects out there where you look and you see like six seven eight writers on their project you start going okay this thing went off the rails yes yeah well you know and there's a lot of money attached to that too so yeah <laughs> yeah it is like a, a mom and pop business if you look at it like that um but i always say that I have projects that I write that I want to direct, that I am set to direct. Right? Cool. But then I have other projects that I'm open for other directors to come on board to direct, that I'll write. I'm, I, I have projects that I'm open for other writers to come on board if you think that there needs to be a, a, set, a, a fresh set of eyes. Cool. Th that's okay. But so you, so writers have to go into Hollywood yeah. Thinking and understanding that it is a business. Yeah. It's a business. You're right. Well, I want to talk to you about something because you write, you write very human characters. And I always yeah. look at screenwriting as a way of exploring humanity. Um, and talking about like I call them universal human truths. Like we've all had to deal with loss, we've all had to deal with suffering in some some certain yeah. way. And, and I like to tie that to the theme or what I'm trying to say to the story. Is that something that you find yourself doing as well? Yeah, I do that. Um, I like to pull from when I'm creating a character, writing characters of people that I know. Oh, okay, Places, cool. Right? Like, and, temp like templates? Yes, like templates. I, and, you know, like some great actors you don't have to be great at some actors they like to people watch okay you would see them true. at a coffee shop in a people watch and i do that when i'm creating a character you're right in, interesting there are people that you if you think about it that you've come in contact with i'm not talking about some of them may be friends yeah. Some of them may be casual people. Some of them may be colleagues that you've worked with, right? Yeah. You, as a writer, need to start people watching energy, people watching I characters. Like I like that. Right? That's how, when I'm coming up with characters, 
you know, sometimes I, if I meet someone that's like, okay, I like that, that person, what that person is showing me, I could structure a character around that person, right? Yeah. That, that energy. Um, and I also like writing like real people, biographies, yeah, uh, real stories. I like that. But even when you're writing true stories, there's also an element of I want to grab somebody else's energy and creativity to create a character right. around some the, the actual person that the story is based on. Yeah, as, as inspiration. Yes, as inspiration. Yeah, no, I think I, that's I, cool. Yeah, you know, I wrote the Tupac Shakur story uh, for HBO. Uh, it was based on a book uh, that they purchased uh, called A Rebel for the Hell of It. Okay. And, um, and most people know the Tupac Shakur story from what they've seen on TV. Um, but this book focused on the younger Tupac. Oh, okay. The, the poetry Tupac. The young poet, the the active, the young son of a civil rights activist, his mom, Afeni, God bless her, uh, and him, uh, she was an activist, and so I wanted to, of course, I we, I needed to focus and stay true to what the characters are in the book, but then I had to create other characters, yeah, fictionalized characters around that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. I mean, I I've used inspirations like that before not just for like real dramatic characters. I've even done it for like something like comedy. I remember at one point I saw a lady on a treadmill smoking a cigarette <laughs> and I thought that was that's a good the character. craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. So I was like, I can write that down and use that, you know? So like the, you could definitely use even not just uh, dramatic characters, but just wacky Walmart people or whatever. Yeah. But you know what? I forget. Jeffrey, there's there's characters all around us. Yeah. Just like you just mentioned, just go to Walmart. Go go <laughs> go, go to McDonald's. No shade on none of these places. But no, go, no, go, of course not. It's go, just go it to, is a thing, you know. Yes, I mean you will see everyday people are characters. Yeah, it's true. And if you just open your eyes and look around and look at people, you will find inspiration. Yeah. As a writer, you'll find inspiration. I love it. Uh, what do you have going on right now that uh, people can find you at? Well, uh, right now I'm working on, I did a short movie called Cure. Okay. And uh, I wrote, of course I wrote it and directed it and produced it and um, played the role of the father. That's me. Right here. Oh, very cool. You're looking like an action hero guy. Look at right. that. Yeah. I did the same thing like I did with Strata Brooklyn, a proof of concept. I shot a proof of concept. And that's okay. something that uh, I'm looking forward to making as a film in a series. Um, and as you mentioned, I am faculty, screenwriting faculty member at AFI, which I absolutely love. Very cool. Uh, in writing for uh, Sundance Institute and directing courses over there from time to time and um, just keeping busy on writing, uh, working and teaching, and then also working on my Hollywood stuff. So uh, pretty You've busy. got that filmmaking hustle going. It, it never goes away. That brings us to today's secret code, which is hustle. You can use that secret code at the Facebook page on the giveaway tab or at the successful screenwriter slash podcast and use the secret code hustle for five free entries. Now back to our show. And it should never go away. And I understand uh, as filmmakers, filmmakers, they do certain amount of movies and then they kind of get exhausted. They get fatigued or they kind of get bored. Like, okay, I want to do I, something yeah. else. Yeah. There's no more stories for them to tell. And I can respect right. that. But for me, I've done so many different things where if it's uh, writing films, writing films for television, or being a creative director and art director for Ubisoft, the video yeah. game company. That's I awesome. Yeah, I wrote the, that's right here to the right, right here. That's cool. And uh, I had the pleasure of working with Ubisoft and being a creative director and art director in Paris and, and wrote the video game. And um, that was an awesome experience. 
And so I always tell uh, writers, you have to start thinking of writing for video games, right. writing for uh, VR, writing for AR, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in this is a new wave of telling stories. We have to start thinking, filmmakers, writers, that this new medium that we're in is not. It's going to happen. It's here right now. Yeah. Right. Just go and uh, get you a VR headset, and you will see a whole bunch of content. It is here. Okay. So we have to start creating and writing stories for that new medium. That is the new wave of uh, filmmaking is through technology in video games. Yeah. I, I think it's also part of your growth as well as a filmmaker and as yes. a writer is taking you into these these different types of mediums and then providing work. I know myself, I'm I'm pretty spread thin and very busy, so I can appreciate how much effort you're putting out there and how hard you work. And, um, and again, I just wanted to really thank you for being on the show, man. No, man, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share in your social media where you can tag us at The Successful Screenwriter.